about to preach. So, uh, <laughs> my name is Mark, and I'm a contributor to the Optimism Collective. And I'm here today to help share some good mental models for roll-ups. Because um, I think that, like, you know, a lot of people have, like, high-level kind of knowledge of roll-ups. But, you know, getting some mental models would like, be a lot of fun things for roll-ups. So, this is Ethers Phoenix. Ethers Phoenix is very important. You should know Ethers Phoenix because Ethers Phoenix will reward you in the future if you play positive sum games today. So just always remember that. So, Bedrock. Bedrock was like our big release uh, of like roll up software, right? And it's a new architecture for roll ups because we've you know, rewritten the system many times. I think Bedrock is like the third or fourth rewrite. Um, basically, the design philosophy, right? Minimal gift from Ethereum. This is really, really important. If you're working on a roll up and your gif from Ethereum is, the bigger your diff from Ethereum is, the more difficult it, is, it, it will be to like keep up, the more difficult it will be to like have uh, people come and contribute. So yeah, minimal diff, most important thing. Um, also, we want to design the proof to fit the system instead of designing the system to fit the proof. You know, early on, early, on, early iterations of Optimism, we designed the proof first and then built the system. And that resulted in a large gift from Ethereum. So we've learned a lot. Cool. So we have a modular design in the way that Bedrock is architected, right? One of the key ideas is that we have this split between the consensus layer client and the execution layer client, right? And shout out to Proto. It would not be possible without Proto and the rest of the Optimism Collective. Um, so, right, we have this OP node, right? The OP node is what replaces the consensus layer client, right? So, um, and then our execution client has like about 1,000 lines of code as the diff. So you could run the run a full you know bedrock node um, running both this execution client with the patch plus the OP node, right? And this allows for a multi-client role architecture. Um, okay, so first important concept: block derivation, right? So what block derivation is? It's basically taking available data. And it does this like filtering and mapping uh, it from the, uh, the available data into the L2 blocks, right? So kind of the problem statement is like, um, you know, out of all the possible data that's available, how do we filter this into uh, the data that we care about? And then turn that data that we care about into the inputs to a blockchain. So for Ethereum, the inputs, that is uh, like the execution payloads. Right, like the input to the execution API, um, right? So, yeah, in practice, this is turning Ethereum call data or block data into L2 blocks. Um, so I think Arbitrum calls this like the filtration function. They, like different projects have like different names, but um, derivation, it's like very important. All right, so, you know, we're very early in the age of rollups, so there's some really cool things that I think that you can do with the derivation function if you like modify it, right? So, what if like uh, we add to the derivation function um, the ability of one rollup to like modify validity conditions <coughs> in another chain's derivation function? Like, what does that look like? I don't think anyone. I'm not aware of any projects building anything like this. It's really cool, you know, design. Um, you know. Can you build threshold cryptography schemes directly into the derivation function itself? So you're kind of adding these like MEP, um, you know, prevention tools to the consensus exactly, or uh, directly into the consensus. And um, the other question is like, can you um, have like a base style leader election directly in the derivation function itself? Um, so. This is like kind of like an idea that the Ethereum Foundation is really into, like allowing layer one Ethereum to basically do the ordering instead of say like the L2 sequencer. So 
these are all design spaces that are very underexplored and could be explored in the future. Um, let's see. Okay, so this is another fun one, right? So this derivation function, right? What happens if you have two different L1s as the individual derivation function, right? So normally, like, right, rollups, they operate, the derivation function operates over one L1, right? It like maps the data into L2 blocks. So what happens if you have two L1s as inputs to the derivation function, right? And then this kind of turns your rollup into a chain or a, a bridge, right? And uh, what if there's a world where, you know, anybody can fully validate the bridge by running these, you know, uh, roll-up nodes? And um, what if uh, you allow for smart contract deployments to this, like, bridge node? Like, uh, you know, what, what, what does that mean for the bridging ecosystem as a whole? Um, so, downside, right? Seven-day withdrawal window um, to withdraw to the other side. So there's two solutions for that. One is uh, you can kind of build these like fast liquidity bridges um, where basically like uh, somebody else um, you know has money on the other side and they can do um, an off-chain validation that you know you withdrew to them and they can just like give you the money and you just like pay them a little fee, right? Um, or you know validity proofs. Um, so. Uh, I suspect that if we had a bunch of you know bridges built like this, it would probably kind of look like the Lightning Network. We have like you know hubs, and, like you know spokes, and then um, you know you could like potentially like have like a payment channel kind of thing, you know, going through them. So this is something I'm really interested in. Um, okay, so Ethers Phoenix. Um, okay, so. We have this concept of deposit transactions, and this is uh, one of the big diffs um, that Optimism Execution has compared to L1 Execution. And basically, um, the idea is that as derivation is running, uh, it will you know build these deposit transactions. So uh, deposit transactions are like not signed by users necessarily; like they are just like included by derivation deterministically and uh, they can also be kind of thought as like system transactions um, so basically the idea is that um, the first transaction of every single L2 block contains contextual information about L1 that gets like pulled into L2 right and like uh, for example like the L1 block number um, the L1 block hash um, the L1 base fee, and then there's like some other like fee parameters. Um, but this kind of allows us to pull information from L1 into L2 that is useful for the L2 system to say like charge fees or um, just APIs for developers. So deposit transactions, um, you know, they can also originate from users, right? This idea is that an L1 event maps directly to a deposit transaction. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping here. Um, and deposit transactions, this is how you kind of get the censorship resistance property, right? Um, assuming that someone on L1 is not going to censor you. Um, like you can, you know, deposit and you're guaranteed that it's pulled into L2 with a relatively low latency because of the way the derivation might work. Okay, so research question. What can we build with generalized system transactions, right? And an example here is because like this idea, right, um, one event on L1 maps directly to a deposit transaction on L2. So um, can we, you know, build an L2 that basically automatically ingests all chain link or updates into L2 automatically? as part of the L2's consensus. Um, technically, Chainlink doesn't emit events, um, you know, because they don't want this kind of thing to happen. But, you know, there's no reason why we can't take, say, the set of execution traces as input to um, the derivation function. 
that would add some more complexity and cost. But you know, if we had the set of execution traces, we could really do anything with this, right? Um, so I think this is a very exciting design space. Um, okay, so question. Can you virtualize liquidity from an L1 AMM into L2? Now, basically, like the idea here, right, is uh, the, the assets would all live on L1 still, right? So, is there like an interesting sort of AMM that you can build or some sort of like uh, DeFi protocol where, um, you know, the set of events that are emitted by this protocol L1 are kind of like virtualized into L2, where users can kind of interact. You know, at a much lower latency, and then there's like some sort of process for kind of batch settling the state back into L1, like ownership wise. So, yeah, I think that this is really interesting for you know people building D5. Cool. So, um, this is another question that I have. So basically, one major problem is you know how do you bootstrap a DeFi ecosystem on an L2? Especially with like proliferation of L2s, you know, there's a lot of L2s that like don't have a lot of liquidity, right? So I'm wondering if it's possible to say, um, you know, oh, okay. So like the problem here is right, lending. Lending is like important in an economy, right? If you want like a good, healthy on-chain economy, you need some. You need to be able to like borrow. You need some of this lending, but. You know, lenders don't want to lend a lot of money unless they're sure that bad debt can be liquidated. And the only way that you can liquidate bad debt is if there's liquidity <coughs> to do so. But if you're on a chain that doesn't have a lot of liquidity, then you know your debt ceiling is only going to be so high. You can only take out so much debt because you need to have enough liquidity. And then like the project needs to like always be aware of how much liquidity is on the chain, so they can basically like you know modify the debt ceiling over time, uh, it's kind of annoying. So my question is, is can we build um, you know, some sort of like trustless liquidation mechanism into L2, where uh, basically through these like events, uh, the derivation pipeline is able to like pull information about liquidity on L1 into L2, and then uh, if we have trustless rails to do the liquidation, can we um, have higher uh, you know, debt ceilings on L2s that don't have a lot of liquidity. So, like, this is like my idea. Um, I have no idea if it'll work, but you know, I would love for like a DeFi project to like test this out. Um, and basically, the idea here is that this is infrastructure that helps to bootstrap liquidity on new L2s. All right, this is a fun one. I really like this one. So this is more of a thought experiment. Um, but the idea is, you know, um, using the same sort of scheme, um, you could create a roll-up where basically all of the ether that is burnt on L1, um, you like, you know, reincarnate that ether into a roll-up uh, where like the person that burned it on L1 gets to own it on L2, right? It's like a very interesting idea. Would that ether be valuable, right? And this is totally something you can build with the OP stack. So I, I hope that someone builds this because it would just be like, really, it'd be really fun. Um, you know, it could be like the new like, you know, new point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, all right, back to multiple clients, right? So what I was saying was executing client requires about a thousand line GIF to work on optimism. So we have OP Geth, that's the client that we maintain. We have OP Aragon, and we also have OP Ref. And they can all sync networks already. Um, so basically the idea here is that client diversity is important for preventing bugs from becoming consensus, right? We've seen this on L1 a bunch of times where there's a network split, and um, you know because there's multiple clients, you know social consensus is easily able to determine which chain to follow, right? So um, yeah, this is why the minimal diff is very important, right? We we are now getting all the work the paradigm team is doing through OP Ref or through Ref for free, and um, like we're just like scaling the contributors by keeping this philosophy of a minimal diff. 
Okay, so proofs. Okay, proofs are very important, right? So proofs, that's how the bridge works, right? You have you know, an optimistic proof or you have a validity proof, right? So basically, the idea is that the way the system was built, it's modular. So it's not coupled to any particular proving system. And the idea is that um, we want client diversity of proofs because for an L2, client diversity of proofs gives you the same security model as like an L1 that has uh, actual client diversity of like full node implementations, right? So, um, because like in the proof system, if there's a bug, right, then like money can be stolen. So the idea is that if we have multiple proofs, then um, like one way to design it would be, you know, if someone is able to show that two proofs resolve differently, then the bridge can be paused, right? And then when the bridge is paused, then social consensus can come in and determine which proof system is like canonical, and then we can triage, fix the bug, and then get like you know the proofs together. So this is this would give the exact same sort of security that L1 has, where multiple full node implementations, you know, they're running, they're running, there's a bug, chain split, social consensus comes in, figures out which chain to listen to, and then picks the right one, fixes the bug. So um, L2s can never be as secure, or they can never truly inherit the security of an L1 unless they have uh, proof diversity. Proof diversity is very, very important. And the thing about the OP stack is that we can adopt validity proofs when they're ready. And there's two different teams, you know, people are here today talking about how they're working on validity proofs. So, you know, um, it's only a matter of time until like the validity proofs are ready and they can be, you know, slotted into the multi-proof system. Okay, so I think that deploying a roll-up is the new deploying a smart contract, right? We have basically, you know, back in 2016, 2017, it was like, you know, pretty crazy, like deploying a smart contract. It was like the wild, wild west, right? Nobody really knew what they were doing, like crazy things were happening, there was a lot of innovation. Um, like deploying a smart contract these days is kind of boring, right? We've like done a ton of stuff, you know, the tooling is very mature. Like we know different design patterns, like we've explored them a ton. So the the future is now you deploy your entire rollup, right? And your smart contract system is in that rollup. And basically this solves one of the major incentive miscompatibilities in the ecosystem, which is DAP developers don't earn any money from usage, right? Um, like you could build a fee into your protocol, for example. Um, Uniswap did that, they haven't turned it on, so you know, who knows, but um, you know, so transaction fees are a source of revenue for apps, right? More users, you know, revenue goes up, right? And that's how like the Web2 world works. So we need this in, you know, crypto and Web3 for Web3 to work. Um, and uh, basically, you know, what we need for this to really be true is we need low latency cross domain messaging. Because once we have low latency cross domain messaging, just liquidity can move between all the different L2s. And you know, there's a bunch of different projects working on this. And I think that this is what will really uh, be like the big unlock. Ethers Phoenix. <laughs> So, all right, so I've got a slide about a role of misconceptions. Um, so basically, you know, there's, um, I think, you know, there's like a, one really healthy way to think about rollups is really like decoupling the bridge and L2 in like L2's finale, right? Um, the outputs, so the outputs of a, of a blockchain or like a rollup would be like, say the state root, right? And like the inputs would be like the block and the transactions. So the, the, the bridge only cares about the outputs. And you should always think about the bridge. Uh, the bridge just needs a view into the output, right? So uh, when, when, you, when you have an output and you like give it to the bridge, so like the state root, and you're, you know, people say like you're like posting the state roots to L1, it's like, it's really like you should think about it as like you're proposing possible outputs. To the bridge, right? And it's up to the bridge 
to like you know defend itself from malicious proposals, right? So in the case of like the zk rollup, like you, know, you need a validity proof, right? The validity proof will prove that this is the correct output that deserves to be in the bridge. And with an optimistic rollup, right? Like in an ideal optimistic rollup, anybody should be able to make a proposal about you know the L2 outputs. So like this is the state of the L2 at this block. Boom, I propose it, right? And then it's up to you know the, the fault proof to basically you know defend <coughs> from malicious outputs, right? So like thinking about the bridge as like a separate thing from the blockchain is a really good mental model because there are two different things. Like one thing that people get confused about is you know if say the fault proof you know uh, removes an output from the the bridge contract, you know does that cause a reorg on L2? In in the world where they're coupled, that makes a lot of sense. But in the world where they're decoupled, it doesn't make any sense because there are two different things. You know, the L2 is like kind of responsible for its own ordering, right? And all of the outputs that are proposed to the bridge, they're proposals. They're not necessarily like, they're not actually saying like, this is what the state of the L2 is. It's like, you know, I claim that this is what the state of the L2 is. So, yeah, the, the outputs are only relevant to the bridge, and the outputs are not relevant to the L2 ordering or the finality of the L2. And um, yeah, the outputs are just to give a view to the L2, um, right? Should be considered as claims rather than the truth. So yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much my presentation. I kind of went really fast. All right, who's got some questions or comments? Why is the bridge withdrawal period of seven days? Well, good question. <laughs> so, well, there there once was like a high priest that came in and said seven days, and then everyone like you know believed it. Um, you know, like I think that like seven days, I would love to figure out ways to reduce seven days. Um, but the idea is that seven days is long enough to say um, play the fault proof game, right, and, and get it included. Um, Arbitrum came up with an interesting way to try to reduce that, mm -hmm. where they used some like probability to kind of look at. Um, I think it was like they, they had something. I don't. It was like the number of blocks that the number of missed slots or something, or the number of. Um, yeah, sensors. They tried to quantify it through uh, reorg out blocks, uh, where like the next the next slot built built on the same block. Instead of like progressing the execution layer, um, the, that the envelope map, right? Is like how many, like the cost to censor how many blocks, assuming you throughout the entire like bridge, right? And so it's like, what is the like censorship fee? And so you call it like, what is the average like fee cost of like a block on L1 and how many blocks or whatever, right? And that's back on the I think last I ran the math, it was like two and a half days, something in that ballpark of like two days. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of assumptions there. Like you're um, assuming that the infrastructure is always live, right? Um, so, like, you know, I think that with uh, with time um, in running these systems in production, we can probably shorten it. But right now, there's like no. Um, okay, so one idea that I was thinking about was, you know, um, can we say like have the fault proof window be the finalization window for the bridge be dynamic based on some sort of like over collateralization of the bond. Yeah. Right? Because the whole idea is that the security comes from the bond um, because you know you, you put down this bond, right? And if you're lying, then the counterparty can like take your bond. Right? So um, one problem here is that you know if the bond becomes under collateralized, right? So you want more time to allow the base fee to come back down so the bond can become collateralized. So it's like a pause of two ETH on L1, I get like one ETH on like L2 or something, and then I got no collateralized bond on the L1, and it can go all faster. Maybe. I have no, yeah, I have no like idea if this will work, yeah. but this is like a design space that I've explored. Uh, it might not work at all, but I do agree like seven days is like a terrible thing. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, there's also like you have to be like back and forth, right? It's like like the multi-roundedness of the interactive game makes it like a much harder design. Because like the other things we had, the Rainbow Bridge right on here was like literally the first transaction that was totally. possible, right? Totally. And then like SMG has done their little like playful experiment of like okay, it's like however many ETH to like buy a block and censor it, which uses the approximation of like totally. that's the cost to guarantee I bought the whole block. Like, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. So we don't we don't have like a concrete design for it yet, but we've explored like a few different things. Um, you know, there's like a world where we kind of have like multiple bridges, and um, you know, I think like there would always be um, some amount of time um, with a validity proof um, that's like added on top. Because like, okay, so one thing about validity proofs is. I really don't understand why everyone talks about validity proofs as if there's not bugs in them, right? They're like brand new crypto. So this is the thing. Validity proofs, bridges that operate on validity proofs, they basically you know, couple execution with proof validation, right? And I think that's a big no-no. And the reason why is because someone that is able to find a bug in that proof, they can submit the proof to the bridge, right? And instantly the execution happens. Right? So the idea with like an optimistic bridge right, is like the proof, uh, the validity of the proof is decoupled from the execution. So this is good because it gives some time for uh, layer zero, like the community, to like notice that someone found a bug in the bridge. So um, I think like in the, in the short term, probably there will be like, you know, if there's a combination of validity proof and optimistic proof, the validity proof will probably shorten the amount of time for the withdrawal, but not make it instant. Um, but this is just like, you know, we don't have like necessarily concrete plans, um, but this is kind of just like, you know, one design space. And potentially, let's say you have two different kind of uh, validity proof code base, one from Luna, one from Restero, and these two, if you agree, we can even make it faster. Totally. So then, then we have like this trade-off between time and cost. Because now you have like this like you know generating many different proofs. It's like you know. So um, hopefully they become you know a lot cheaper, so it's easier to do things like that. But yeah, completely. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Number one is uh, this bond value. How much is it right now? Um, and I just do not have a good mental model, and I didn't find it on the docs. And the second one is, how do you think PBS impacts the censorship resistance of layer twos? And yeah, totally, uh, great question. So the general, there's there's two ways that you can design bonds. Um, the the better way to design bonds is um, basically you you always every uh, every step in the game, right? Um, you pay, you put a bond down that is large enough for the next step. So this keeps the bonds relatively small. And the, so this means the bond size is relative to the amount of gas that's used for the next step. So ideally, um, we can have like really optimized smart contracts to keep the bond size low. Like how low? Is that 2 E, 200 E? Oh, it'll probably be lower than that. It'll oh, okay. probably be like, you know, just ballpark and like maybe like point one e. Got it. But like, you know, um, early on we'll probably add like a nice like padding to it. So like, you know, just in case uh, the infrastructure is like down or something, right? Um, but over time as we run it more, I'm sure that we can make the bonds more efficient. Um, both by like being sure that it works in practice and, um, you know, optimizing the smart contracts. Also like, data analysis of like the base fee price over time, right? And, um, but like one thing is, is that, you know, past performance doesn't indicate like, you know, the way the future is gonna play out, right? Every bull market is different in its own like insane way. So if we just strictly rely on like historical data, we were like, all right, we want like, you know, five nines of assurance that the bond will be, you know, large enough during the, these like, this amount of time, um, you know, I have no idea if 
there's going to be another like uh, more apes sort of thing that pushes the gas price to like an absurd amount. Um, so yeah, I think TLDR, um, it won't be like many ETH. Um, it'll probably be larger than it needs to be early on. And um, yeah, it'll get smaller over time. And then your other question was about PBS. Okay, fun. So, okay, so. <laughs> Um, okay, Flashbots made, uh, or it was Nethermind actually, uh, made a proof of concept of MEV Boost uh, with the OP stack. So uh, it does work. Um, you know, we have, we, we don't. Sorry, let me. I was asking from a censorship resistant perspective oh, okay. because now I can sorry, sorry. bribe builders to always censor your thing, become that cheaper, the more expensive. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's totally a thing. Um, you know, it's. It, I would say it's like very similar to L1. Um, I think with lower latency, the game <coughs> is a little bit different, um, right? Because um, you know I have no idea if the re if this is my intuition. I don't know if the data backs me up, so like help me out here. But uh, my intuition is that with faster block times, um, you have less of an advantage of like having like the best algo uh, because like if you have the best algo and you have like long block time. Your, your really good algo can like crank for a really long time building the block. Um, and then you also have like, um, with, with, but then like with short block times, you know, like you have to build a block really quickly. Um, so like, you know, like having like a really good algo like might not be the best thing. Like you might have like more simple heuristics that like more people can figure out for building blocks and L2s. Um, so, you know, I have no idea if you know, the same block builders will always win PBS and L2 with low block time and like they'll censor. Um, I have no idea if there will be many block builders and they'll be like more difficult to build an app with. So yeah, I really have no idea. I don't know. Nobody is running PBS in production on an L2 with, this, with like two second block time. So. I I don't know if this question makes sense, but uh, I like people talk a lot about forced inclusion uh, with worlds. Is there such thing as forced execution? Does that sort of end up? So forced inclusion place? is forced execution, at least with the OP stack. Um, basically, and it's it's low latency as well. Um, basically, like the idea is that um, you um, you send a transaction on L1 to this particular contract. It emits an event, and you know. Um, we run, you know, a uh, like we, we run with a confirmation depth of like three, I believe, on mainnet. So, you know, within you know three blocks, you know, your deposit will be pulled in. And you could, in theory, run with you know no um, confirmation depth and just like instantly be pulling in the L1 blocks and like instantly, you know. Uh, including deposits, and as soon as a deposit is included, it's executed. So if there's like L1 block and my transaction is in there to be forced included, <coughs> and then there's an L2 block, I'm like guaranteed it will be executed before the L2. Um, yeah, so every L1 block corresponds to one or more L2 blocks. Um, on, you know, on OP mainnet base, there's six L2 blocks that correspond to every L1 block because the block time is two seconds. So um, when you like send a deposit to this contract in L1, uh, basically it'll be pulled into the derivation pipeline and instantly be turned into a deposit and then instantly executed. And all the deposits are placed in front of the L2 block. Um, so it's like. Uh, the sequencer doesn't get to choose when it includes the deposits. It's like built directly into the protocol, into the derivation pipeline. So you're guaranteed to get this like low latency deposit. So yeah, question. Both what you just said previously about validity proof. You said that even with it, they're going to be a, good, uh, a window because uh, because. It's I do not fully understand. I do not fully understand why you're saying that, and I do not agree. Okay. I, I, I don't. 
white. It's been white and we'll still want to have a ready uh, window. Totally. So, I mean, you know, definitely feel free to disagree, but um, I 100% believe that someone will steal a ton of money out of the bridge that is secured by the proofs because, like, you know, even Zcash had a bug in its implementation. I think ZK Sync, um, you know, I heard one in Aztec. Um, I think that all these proof systems have bugs in them right now. Okay, you know, in addition, you need not, not the, the, the cryptographic uh, protocols. Oh, I'm not, I'm not an expert. Okay. Um, so, like, you know, I can't claim about the uh, actual, like, the protocols, like the math. I can't make any claims about that. But the implementations definitely have bugs. In I do agree with that. Okay. Uh, but all the protocols will be also in danger then. I mean, uh, what's, I mean, uh, that's a big, uh, I understand the assumption, but isn't that careful? Uh, I, I, you could no, say, everyone no, can choose their own risk uh, parameters. And also note that like these designs aren't necessarily finalized, but it's, you know, uh, basically, like when you're rolling out new cryptography, right? Like boring cryptography is the best cryptography. Like I love cryptography that's been around for like years and years and years, and like is trusted, nice and boring. You know, it's been in production for like 20 years. Like that's the best kind of cryptography. You know, and definitely, you know, feel free to disagree. That's perfectly cool. Um, but. All of this new cryptography is amazing. I love it, and thank you so much for like implementing it. It's amazing, great work. But you know, it's very new, so we have no idea what sorts of attacks are like in it, what sorts of bugs are in it, right? And if we just start yoloing it into bridges, there 100% will be hacks, and people will lose a lot of money, like without a doubt. So I think that like as a community, we need to be responsible with like the way that we secure our bridges. And this is just my personal philosophy. It's perfectly cool if, like, you disagree. And some of the protocols already have a pretty good even as well. So the, some of the ZK EVM protocols, they actually have the uh, kind of a mandatory delay when you withdraw access. Just, just so to cover the scenario where, just in case there's a bug, or just in case something bad happens, or in case there's some way to fix it. ZK Seek has one thing to so, it, it, like, even like the teams that are building that have the delay. ZK Sync had how long? One day. One day. Uh, and they have a cost. Okay. So, with OP stack, you could like build many rollups, right? So, imagine the sequence that goes away. Like, I'm, I'm not running it anymore. And I have like a bunch of cash on it. Can I withdraw? Totally. Okay. So, okay. In the current version <coughs> of, of uh, the OP stack, no. Yeah. Um, so the bridge's liveliness depends on a permission actor right. in the current system. But a future uh, iteration will remove that restriction. And anyone will be able to uh, basically propose the state of L2, the outputs, to the bridge. And then basically in the world where the sequencer goes away, uh, you know, Anybody will be able to just like you know propose say like this is the state of L two of this block, you know, and then um, prove their um, withdrawal. Um, right. But how would that state be validated? Because I have to propose a valid state transition, right? So how would how would that validation work? Great question. So uh, liveliness of OP stack chains is guaranteed as long as L one is live. Okay. So if there's no sequencer, then the uh, L1 blocks uh, will still be like, uh, you know, you can just turn on a node and it will start, you know, pulling in L1 blocks and it will make, you know, blocks that only contain deposits. Okay. Right? So the idea here is that if the sequencer <coughs> does not make the data available, um, you know, soon enough, then the chain will, you know, just start uh, continuing on and making, like, blocks only full of deposits you know, like leave the sequencer behind. Um, so um, this is what kind of gives you the ability to withdraw uh, no matter what. Because what you can do is uh, basically you send a deposit to the L2, right? And then the L2 
then basically you know triggers your withdrawal, right? And then um, you know your you know full node um, is able to like you know your full full node is still live because L1 is live, right? right? So you're able to like reconstruct the deposit only blocks, right. right? And then you know what the state root is, so then you can take that state root and propose it to the bridge, and then um, you know um, in, in like this is after we upgrade, right? We have like anyone can make proposals to the bridge, right? And then the way that it would work is, uh, you know, if uh, you're lying, then the fault proof would, you know, dispute it okay. and then remove it. But if you're telling the truth, then, you know, your proposal would sit there for one week okay. and then you'd be able to, like, you know, do your withdrawal. Okay, okay. The fault proof system decides if my state transition is correct or not. Uh, yes, the, the fault proof system determines if your claim about oh, L2 yeah. state is valid. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, last two questions. <laughs> uh, what do you think of uh, insurance based bridges and solution? Um, you said insurance based bridges? Yeah. Can you elaborate a little more? So, uh, insurance based bridges, uh, I think it's not that popular. Thank you. 